Here we are again, folks. You are with Alexandra Paul and Dotsie Bausch on the Switch for Good podcast. So welcome. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, Dotsie. It's great to be here. Yes, always is. Now, when this show, this episode airs, the fires in California are going to be out, I really hope. Um, but California has been ravaged with devastating fires for the last three Octobers in a row, right? Last last three. And you specifically um, have evacuated not once, not twice, but three times. Actually, I have different- never <coughs> evacuated, but I've been told that I have to prepare for evacuation. So we have to pack our cars, get right. our... So you prepared to evacuate three times, Yes, packing the car, getting all your important... And twice in the last week. Okay, so what? obviously the planet's in distress. Um, We're in a drought. We've been in a drought for a while. But you are an environmental expert, I think. I don't know about that. No, you are. You are. You speak about it um, quite eloquently and quite factually. What what is going on and what, what can we do? Well, we are getting more wildfires all across the world. Yeah. I mean, Australia in September of 2019 had 100 wildfires burning in two of their states, not even their whole country. And there have been devastating wildfires all around the world. But California has been hit extra hard because, well, Australia was in a big drought, but California, we've had a drought for seven years now. Yeah, there's rain, but it's not enough. And... We are getting wildfires five times more often than we did in the 70s, and they are bigger. And the last, mm, I think the 15 of the last 20 wildfires here in California, um, have the biggest ones have occurred since in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So it's just been exponential, and the reason is because of climate change. Because climate change is means more droughts in certain areas, and that is exacerbating the wildfires. So what uh, what can what can a person do? Well, you know, it's interesting when the Amazon was burning earlier in 2019. W- the main driver of Amazon burning was uh, people who were slashing and burning forest. It was not necessarily wildfires out of control. It was human beings slashing and burning parts of forest so they could clear the forest for animal agriculture. So, Dotsie, you and I have talked about this a lot, but going taking animal products out of your diet helps not only your own health, not only helps the animals, but it helps the environment and future generations, therefore. Right, because if there's no demand, then they're going to eventually stop clearing the Amazon for it because no one wants it. They're not going to make it. They're, they're not, not going to need all that land because, yeah, animal agriculture is, a wa- is such a waste of land, not only to graze the cows, but to grow the food for the livestock th- that then people eat instead of just mm-hmm. growing the food for humans and then saving the rest of the land for nature. Yep. Um, so it's a it's a it's a big thing, folks. So if you care about the environment and you care about these wildfires, you can actually have an effect wherever you live um, on the planet uh, of lessening these wildfires by going vegan. Right. Power to the people on your plate. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Every right. single meal. Exactly. We have an opportunity. Well, we have a super rad guest. Uh, we have George Laroque. In the studio from Canada, not right next to us. <laughs> Unfortunately, not right <laughs> next to us. Oh, <laughs> uh, so uh, George, while an advocate for animals and humanity, uh, he was once a fighter on the ice. Yeah. George is a retired professional hockey player with 13 years of experience in the NHL. He earned his spot as a enforcer. That's a role that mandates strength, size, and at times. Fist fights on the ice. <laughs> Yet you wouldn't know it from his personality. He's a compassionate vegan, humanitarian, author, longtime yogi, giving back to his Montreal community and the world in any way that he can. From his work in nonprofits to his impressive professional athletic experience, he has a lot to share. So we're going to dive in. Welcome, welcome, George. Thanks for inviting me. Yes. Well, I have to just jump right into uh, your enforcer role on the ice. So, yeah, describe what an enforcer is and the role that you play within the team on the ice. 
Well, uh, you know, it's not something that I'm really proud of, but it was my job. And one of my job was protecting the star players. And uh, to do that, sometimes you, you have to fight. Uh, it, fighting is legal in hockey, but slowly it's coming off. Like uh, they're taking fighting out of the game because of the danger of it. They saw what the head injury did in the NFL and they want to take the head injury out of hockey. I feel really fortunate after 13 years that I haven't suffered from any uh, concussion, any uh, brain uh, any brain issue from all the fighting. But, uh, yeah, it was a tough job to do. I did it for 13 years. I'm okay today. I'm glad I am. I, I'm really one of the lucky ones. But uh, I wouldn't recommend anyone to, to, to do this because uh, it was a hard, uh, a hard job, especially the fact that we're doing a fist fight, no gloves or anything, right? So right. I feel really fortunate. Okay. Well, I'm not going to sign up to be an enforcer. Right? I've just changed my <laughs> mind. Um, you, can you, you guys are too beautiful to sign up for this. Oh, that's very sweet. Um, can, can you just play out a scenario for me? Because you said protect the star player. Can you just run through what a scenario might be so we can get a picture? Well, sometimes, you know, hockey is so physical, right? You can do body checks. So let's say, uh, you know, a fourth line player, because there's four line in hockey, usually the fourth line is always the bigger guy. So if you get big guys hitting, you know, a star player on the team, then you want to, you know, teach him a lesson that not to do that. Don't be physical against your team. So you might go after him and say, hey, you ran one of my players. You have to answer to me. You have to answer the bell if you did a cheap shot, stuff like this. And sometimes for... Uh, just for the show, sometimes to get the crowds uh, pumping. If your team is losing by, by a couple goals, sometimes a big fight could change momentum. There's so many different reasons why you would get into a fight. But again, uh, you really have to be a hockey fight to understand that because a lot of people that, that came and watched hockey, they, sometimes they looked at the fight, they're like, uh, isn't the point is to put the pucks in the net? They <laughs> right. didn't quite understand that. So it's quite ironic, actually. You know, I, I read that you actually, uh, when before games where, especially the ones where you knew they would put you in to fight, that you would feel, you'd get sick before, the night before. You'd be, vomit because you really, wasn't your nature. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I never grew up to be a fighter. When you're a kid and you play hockey, you think that, you know, you're going to be there for your skills. So I never thought I was going to do that. And and fighting gave me a lot of anxiety because you could actually die. It crosses your mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Fighting on the ice, you never know what could happen, right? And fighting big guys, again, uh, you all, the thing you always hope is that you're okay after. And the other guy is okay, too, because the goal is not really to hurt anyone. It's just not to get hurt and not to look bad in front of millions of people watching you. So, yes, uh, uh, because of the anxiety I did before games that I knew it could happen, uh, I would uh, meditate and pray a lot to calm myself down because... Uh, it was really intense. Uh, the, the hardest part of fighting is always the night before getting into it, the anxiety, because the fighting itself, because of the adrenaline, you don't feel much when it happens, but the building up to it is the hardest part. So you are um, of Haitian descent, right? Your, your parents, yes. and they immigrated to Canada. How yeah. old were you? Uh, I was born in Montreal, actually. My parents came to oh. Montreal at 20 years old to give a better life to a my brother and my sister, because they, they live in Haiti in the uh, Duvalier time where uh, the government was uh, slaughtering a lot of people. So uh, they came to Montreal. They were sponsored by their, their cousin that were already there. And uh, that's, that's why I got to play hockey, because I was born in Montreal. Right. That's what I was wondering. So did you, did you start when you were a little boy? They threw you in. Yes, you had I, a lot of energy, and it's like, let's go, <laughs> go play hockey. Well, you know, you know what's funny is that my parents, uh, they hated winter. Uh, they didn't, right. The first time they experienced winter from 80, they had three winter jacket on because they're like, oh, my God, what is this? <laughs> Thankfully, I was born in December. So <laughs> in the winter, I'd go out with short and T-shirt running in the snow because I love I love uh, the snow and the cold. I like the winter more than the summer. And my parents were like, this is not our son. What's wrong with him? <laughs> and the fact that I wanted to play hockey, they hated it because they were freezing out of hockey rinks. So, and I just loved it because... When you're born in Montreal, if you don't play hockey, you're an alien. You know, right. you have no friends because every kid, when they're born in Montreal, wants to play hockey and wants to be an NHL. So I was just like every other kid. And when I grew up, I told my dad, I want to play hockey. And he was like, I don't know what that is, but if you want to play hockey, fine. But I'm not going to teach you. I'm not going to show you because I don't understand that sport. Because my dad was a soccer guy. And, <laughs> and, and I pretty much, I have to say that I pretty much did it all on my own. Well, George, you talk about being an alien, and as a black boy playing hockey in Canada, 
well, even as a black man in the eight, in NHL, in the, in the over 100 years of uh, the NHL, there's only been 70 black players. So yeah. you you have been um, uncommon an uncommon sight in hockey for a long time. Uh, talk to us about how it was pl- as a boy playing hockey as a boy a bl- with black skin. Well, you know, hockey is always and still known as a white man's sport. So yeah. I have to fight through a lot of racism to make it in the NHL. When I was a kid and, and, and I was a minor, uh, I remember when I was playing, uh, parents were shouting uh, the N word at me from the stands. It, it was unreal. It, it, it was sickening. And my parents, that's another reason why they didn't want me to play because they said, George, there's no role model playing hockey. So, you know, it's not good for you. It's going to affect you as, a, as an adult if you grew up in this hatred. And I was like, I can't quit because they're going to win. And I want to make it in the NHL. They're like, that's why my parents wouldn't go to the ring because there was too much racism and they couldn't fight with every parent. So they're like, you know what? Mm-hmm. If you really want to do this, we're not going to stop you, but you're going to have to go on your own. And I remember in the winter riding the bike with my equipment on my back when I was seven years old and I was doing that on my own. I'd be falling on the snow and people were laughing at me in their cars. They didn't care. And I was like, you know what? I don't care that you're laughing at me. I'm going to make it. I was seven and eight. And, and, and the, the older you got, the hardest that it was. Because now kids understood some of the words you could throw to a, to, to a black man to hurt him. And I was alone. Uh, we live in a urban city an hour away from Montreal where, where I, I was enduring all this on my own. But it made me stronger. And, you know, I knew I was going to make it to the NHL despite that. Even though my parents every day, they would tell me, quit. You shouldn't play hockey. You're not going to make it. My own parents were telling me that. They were telling me the same thing as the people were, that were shouting uh, racial slur at me was. And I was like, one day I'm going to prove those people and my parents that I'm going to make it. And, you know, when I did, you know, I thanked everybody that that, um, that were negative towards me because they gave me, uh, they gave me additional motivation to make it to the NHL. And I'm really gr- glad that I uh, stuck to my guts and uh, the proudest that I was, the fact that I make it to the NHL, that I, sh- I proved everybody wrong. Yeah, we read that you heard the N-word so much that you thought it was your name when you were yeah, little no, man for a while. It was insane. Oh, I mean, at some, I would sometime, I remember, um, you know, being at the rink and they, they were making song with that. Oh. And, and it was insane. They, it, it was unreal. When I look at my road to make it to the NHL, what I had to go through, it's surreal. That's why I had to write a book about it because I know that there's some other minorities that are suffering some type of discrimination. And I wanted to share with them my story because to show them that nothing is impossible and doesn't matter if people don't believe in you. If you believe in yourself, you make all the right sacrifice. You could achieve anything. Was it just really that like deep desire and determination to prove all of those racist naysayers wrong? Or was it just a, a, a real love for hockey and playing the sport or, or maybe both? Th- th- that's a good question because, uh, you know, when I look back, when I was a kid, I loved soccer better. I love soccer better and American football better because I was always bigger than everybody. And I remember when I was playing soccer, I was dominating. When I played American football, I was really good and I had even a scholarship to go to the States. But the thing with hockey is that if you look at this three sport, I knew that if I look at looking at the odds, the, the the less chance I had was in hockey. Like when you look at a guy with my shape should have been playing football. Still, when I was playing the NHL, a lot of people thought I was a football player. I was built to be a football player. But because of everything that I had to endure when I was a kid, even though hockey was not my favorite sport, I choose hockey, the hardest role, because I wanted to be a role model. I read Jackie Robinson's book when I was a kid. He was the first black player to play baseball. And I was like, one day, I want to break color barrier like Jackie did, even though I wasn't the first one, and write a book like he did to inspire others that are fighting through racism to make it to the NHL. So I decided, as a young age, to choose the hardest route just to be a role model. When you think of it, it's crazy because it wasn't my favorite sport, and I knew I had more chance in football. Hmm. But when I look it all up today, it paid off. But that story is crazy because often people just assume, oh, Hockey is your favorite sport, but it's not. It's just that I figured if I choose another sport, it'd show everybody that they won. I would have meant that they won because, you know what? It's too hard 
let's go somewhere else because everything they said when I was when I, when I was young, they were right. So they win. And that's how I looked at it. So that's why I stuck with hockey. How, how long did it take for you to get signed in the NHL? And what was that day like for you uh, when you got signed yeah, to your way, first team? Yeah, the way it works when you play minor hockey, you play up to like 16 and then you get drafted major AAA, you play junior hockey. So up to then, you know, up to then when you play a junior hockey, um, you know, you don't know what's going to happen because you're hoping to get drafted in the NHL. And I got drafted in the second round uh, from the Edmonton Oilers from junior hockey. But getting drafted is easy. Making it is not a thing. So I played two years in the farm team, in the farm team of the Edmonton Oilers in, in Hamilton. And then after that, I became a regular in the NHL. And, and I remember, like, it was yesterday when I did, and I was talking to media, I thanked everybody that uh, uh, threw racial slur at me when I was a kid. And I told them, because of you, you guys give me the ad- additional motivation I needed to make it to the NHL. You guys push me because they push me even harder because I don't even know if with all that negative energy that I got from them, I would have had enough energy to make it to the NHL. So it's because of all their push and because of so many people not believing in me that I was able to push myself and show them, prove them wrong and say, one day you guys are going to see. And uh, yeah, it happened. And how was it when you actually got to the NHL in terms of racism and acceptance? No, the NHL is totally different. Now you're playing the leagues of men. There's so many different uh, ethnies there. there. There's other black men. There's Russian players, Czech players, like European players. There's, there's all types. It's like United Nations was in, in the NHL. So there was, uh, I never have really had to deal with any racism other than a small incident that happened. But but uh, it, it was really isolated. But most of, most of all, like I felt really respected when I played there. And uh, also with the job that I had, uh, it would be to the interest of any guys to respect uh, my background because since I was a fighter and they weren't, yeah. they know how I would deal with it, like as a man. So, uh, but no, I never had a problem w- w- in that regard. But how is it now then, if you, if a, for a black boy or girl now playing hockey as a kid, because the reason. Th- y- Dati entered her sport as a cyclist late, but mm-hmm. most athletes they bec- they become excellent at their sport because they start it really young. Sure. So if you have all this racism at a very young age, that's going to impede a lot of uh, black kids from coming up and changing the system uh, and making the NHL much more diverse. Well, it, it's still an issue. Uh, there's still lots of a uh, l- l- lot of minority that that won't play hockey because of that because they consider that it's still considered a white man's sport and there's not enough role model in it. And they know that there's still a lot of racism in hockey and that's why they're afraid to uh, to get in that sport because they know it's going to be hard. There's still racism today, not as bad as there is. Still incident that happens still every year. It's not as bad as it was to me when I was playing like 20 or 30 years ago. But now there's still improvement to be made. But the NHL has the diversity task force that they do to get the... Uh, you know, hockey uh, available to, to all, like, everywhere, to show hockey is for everyone, to encourage kids to, to play uh, for the love of the game. So uh, there's a lot of progress to do, but it's for sure every year is getting better. But, uh, you know, uh, hockey is also an expensive sport, and uh, a lot of minority family can't afford it because, you know, you play basketball, soccer, you just need a pair of shoes and hockey. The equipment, the stick, and everything you need, you know, for a kid, it's like, it's at least a thousand bucks and kids grow mm-hmm. so fast that every year getting new equipment is so expensive. So the fact that it's a expensive sport on top of the fact that, you know, minorities parents don't know much about that sport and they can't play the sport. So how do you teach it to your kids? All those things combined makes it a really still today, a hard sport to, for young black kids to, to get into. Mm-hmm. So you Obviously, because <laughs> if you're watching this, you can see. If not, um, George is uh, not miniature size. Uh, <laughs> the opposite of. So you were able to obviously maintain your size and be an enforcer and be very successful as a hockey player and then after in retirement um, on a plant-based diet. Yeah. Which just goes against, right, the, the whole long-standing issue and belief that is perpetuated by animal agriculture, right? That especially men cannot 
be strong and do, do the big ball sports, puck sports, whatever, you know, and the hockey, football, uh, basketball type of sports, uh, and be able to build enough muscle to maintain strength, to be able to be powerful enough and strong enough to do what you do. How did you do that? Actually, that was my last year in the NHL that, that I became vegan. Uh, and my last year that I played with Montreal Canadian, mm-hmm. I saw a documentary called Hearthlings, and it showed how bad animals suffer to end up in their plate, how bad it is for the environment and for health. When I saw this, I, w- I went nuts because I didn't know any of that stuff. And I was like, you know what? Um, that's it. I can't encourage those industries anymore. And I'm probably going to lose all my muscle and uh, probably going to get booed out of my sport, but I don't care if it's what it takes for me to respect animals and and to be against an industry, I don't care because I thought I was going to die. I, I I thought that my life was going to be over because I was like, what am I going to do, you know? Because all those stereotypes, I thought them. Yeah, I was like, you know what? I hate tofu and I don't, I'm going to starve to death. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to... Be... All this stuff that people thought, I thought that way. But even though I saw it, I was like, it didn't matter. I cried and I was like, that's it. So I went to see a vegan nutritionist. I was like, I decided to be vegan. I went back home, everything had animal product. I put that in a bag and I went to give that to a, to a place for the homeless people. And I had nothing to eat. Uh, I didn't know what to do. And then at that time I was like, you know what? Um, that's fine. Like whatever I have to do when I told the nutritionist, if I lose my muscle, tell me what to do. And that's when she helped me and she told me what to do and what I could eat and all the stuff that I could do. And, and everything I heard before were lies. You know, I, I was totally wrong about what I thought about, uh, you know, the, 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 the vegan industry. And I did testing before and after uh, to see if it was true that I would get stronger by being vegan. And uh, everything I thought about was wrong. I was healthier. I was stronger. I had more endurance. Everything was much easier. Uh, I didn't have to sleep as much. I wasn't always tired. And I was like, wow, I should have done that a long time ago because I would have played for sure longer in the NHL. And it was just something that was so good for me that I started uh, doing public speaking about it all around the world and talk about my story. Because often when people talk about veganism, it's doctors that are 100 pounds wet and they levitate when there's too much wind. (laughs) When the big black elephant that was a fighter talks about veganism, people are like, wow, how do you do it? What do you do for protein? So you catch way more attention that way. And that's why I thought that... uh, you know what, uh, if I could inspire people to, to uh, live a healthier lifestyle, you know, I'm going to devote my life uh, to help as many people to see clearly because, uh, you know, because just like me for many years, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people that didn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. So what, what did your nutritionist tell you that helped you get on a healthy, uh, powerful vegan diet? Well, the first thing is she laughed at me because... When I told her that, uh, you know, I'm done, I'm going to lose all my muscle, but I don't care. I want to be vegan now because I saw how bad that animal was suffering, how bad it was for the environment, my health. I was like, that's it. So I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I'm done. She's just laugh and laugh. She's like, don't listen to all these things. Those are all like carnivores that, that are coming up with, <laughs> with things to scare people that wants to be vegan. The meat industry sending all those studies to discourage people to be vegan. And she told me about, how, how it works, like how the body works and w- what is it all about, the protein that everybody talks about that is so important. And then when she explained me all that, we went to a grocery store and she showed me, you know, kale lettuce. I didn't even know what that was. <sighs> and, you know, when you find out that in kale there's more iron and calcium than a glass of milk and things like this, you're like, oh, my God, we don't learn about that stuff. What we learn is that you need to drink milk to have strong bones, right? So... There's so many info that she showed me on different type of food and superfood that could replace what I was taking before that was much better and healthier that it was unreal. I was having more energy and, and I didn't lose any muscle and I was getting stronger. I was getting leaner. I, my cardio was getting much better. And then that's when I saw that everything that we hear from before were just lies. Mm-hmm. And, and it's insane because when you think of it, the TV, the ads are pretty much... Uh, uh, sending, an, uh, sending us a subliminal message to buy crap. But the healthy, like, healthy diet, it's not online. You know, when you see a carrot company or a kale company or a broccoli company that says, eat me, you're going to feel much better. <laughs> you don't see that. But the stuff you see online is crap that people eat because it's on TV. It means that it's good, right? We all get, like, blind by all that stuff. 
I was the same way before. And when I saw my nutrition, it should just open up my eyes about what I was putting in my body that was bad, contrary to what I was doing before, like to, to know what I do now. And that's why I started feeling much better. And I saw a big difference. And I was like, wow, I have to share the news to a lot of people because, you know, like often when you hear somebody talks about veganism uh, before, like it's there were people that were so skinny and, and, and you know, you look at them you're like, oh, I don't want to be that skinny. It doesn't look healthy. And when they saw me, you know, a big guy that, that, that was fighting that they're like, how does he do it? Then it catch people's attention because it's like, oh, well, if he does it, he keeps all his strength, then it's not true. The fact you lose all your muscle mass. So mm-hmm. I started doing public speaking all around the world to, to uh, tell my story so people could know that they have nothing to be afraid of when there's anything to do with veganism. Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group and tell us what you want. So what did she what exactly did she tell you about protein because we we certainly know that all protein originates in plants, right? The main three animals that we eat, let's just say cows, pigs, and chicken, eat their protein uh, via plants. And then it's recycled through the animal. And then we eat the animal, make, you know, making us believe, obviously, that we need animals for protein. What did your nutritionist specifically teach you about protein? Okay, well, she told me that, first of all, uh, the, the thing about, you know, needing meat uh, for a certain amount of meat for protein and the fact that you need a certain amount of scoop in the and a, and a shake, that's not the point at all. The best way to have protein is through plants. Because first of all, when you eat animal product, you eat the protein you eat from animals, it's dead, it's dead protein. An animal that eats another one, you know, when you think of it, uh, you know, it eats an animal alive. So there's enzyme and the animal is alive when you're eating through the flesh. But us, when you eat meat, it's dead protein because it's been cut, it's been put in a freezer, it's been cooked, it's been, and, and, you know, and it, it's been manipulated so many ways with HGH chemical in it. It's dead protein that is not good and it's staying in our, in our body for so long. And it's actually creating more problem than there is. And your body uses so much energy to digest it. That energy, you lose it to do your sport. So what she told me pretty much is that protein is a combination of amino acid. So when you actually eat meat, my body works so hard to dissect it in amino acid to assimilate it. But the best way, George, to eat meat is to eat a combination of amino acid, which will replace the protein meat that you would have. So all you have to know is what what uh, what food is rich in amino acids. So all green vegetables, kale, like uh, all type of different beans, uh, you know, broccoli, mushroom is rich in it, um, pumpkin seeds, um, you know, like there, there's so many stuff, nuts, all that food, all amino acid, and throughout the day. When you combine them together, you get the complete protein. And once she t- started telling me all this, I was like, really? I, I didn't know any of that stuff. So I started to try it you know, throughout the day because often people say, if you're just eating salad, you're, gonna, you know, you're not going to be stuffed. But actually, it was true. Like throughout the day, I ate more variety of stuff than I did before. And at the end of the day, I was not hungry and my body felt fulfilled. And I felt much healthier that way, and my, and I was and and I wasn't tired to digest what I had because your body recognizes amino acid, so it assimilates it, other than fighting to digest it, and you waste that energy. And that's why often people that eat a lot of meat, they're often tired and they have bad blood circulation. 
Mm -hmm. You mentioned before that um, f when you switch over to, from an omnivore, almost overnight to a vegan, you had some a test taken that really showed that your yeah. physiology was doing better. Were those blood lipids or um, inflammatory markers or blood pressure? Arteri like what were the tests and what, what did they show? Because I had high blood pressure and asthma before. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I went to a heart institute to do tests before and after because when I went to see her and she told me all that stuff and it's going to be much better, I was like, oh, you know what? I'm going to do a test and I'm going to document it. And it's actually, it's in, you can see it on YouTube, but, but it's in French. Sorry, so you want to understand it. So I do testing before and after. So I went to the heart institute. I said, can you do me a battery of tests and I'll come four months later to compare? So they did blood tests, strength tests, cardiovascular tests. Uh, my, uh, you know, my my uh, blood pressure, my asthma, and everything. Four months later, I went back to do the same test, and the doctor that was not even a doctor that endorsed veganism, when he saw the test after four months being vegan, even him, which is a well-known heart doctor in Montreal, mm. couldn't believe the result. He couldn't believe the difference from before and after, what, just because of food. He was bl it blew in his mind, and it was like George, I, I. I I'm flabbergasted. I can't believe it. You score up the charge on everything. You, your blood is better. Everything on your body, your strength. It, it, it was amazing. And when I saw that, that's when I really knew that, you know, this is a lifestyle I should adopt a long time ago because we're talking, we're talking about four months that did this major transformation. And that's when I started to, to uh, rent a room every month and invite people like publicly for free to come and watch our things. And I would do a conference after to talk about it, to inspire people, to change their lifestyle, to 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 feel better. Did you do the uh, did you did you do the voice, the French translation of Earthlings? Yes, because what happened is uh, after talking about Earthlings so many times, the fact that you live in Montreal, right? People in Montreal with a the language, they don't want to see something in English with subtitle. Right. So it was hard to get the French people to come and watch it. So because I talk about it so much, the producer Sean Monson talked to me and was like, "Would you be interested?" of doing the French narration of hurtling so then people that speak the language would be encouraged to watch it. So he came to Montreal and for free I donated all my time and that's why if I watch hurtlings now I when I did the French narration I could pretty much do, put the image on and, and do the voiceover because I did it so many times. Mm -hmm. I had two French teachers beside me to make sure that I was doing the text properly, that it was matching up the image of what I was seeing. And it's so hard to see those images that to actually you read a text at the same time as watching image like this, it was the hardest part. So it's really sunk to my head. But yeah, I did it to try to help to get help people to watch in it and uh, not using the excuse that, oh, it's not in my language, I can't watch it. So I did it and uh, people in France and everybody spoke the language were able to see it. And I, I was able to help as many people as possible by simply having this, this uh, documentary uh, um, you know, available for free online. You need to do the French narration of Game Changers. Have you seen the Game Changers yet? The of, film? of course I have. I'm, I'm at the end of it. I don't know if you guys saw when Pat Boamans does the, the re record breaker for, uh, for you know, when he's walking with his weight. Of course, the, you're the, there. The, the, the big uh, black guy with uh, oh! you know, the, the green T-shirt. It's me in the back. I'm cheering him on and stuff. So you can actually see me uh, in, uh, at the end of oh, the movie. Well, you should have been way more in there because yeah. this story is just it's so incredible. Yeah, for sure. Now, so... When you you said the NHL didn't have a lot of racism in it when you didn't experience the racism you did when you were a child when you entered the NHL, but how was it when you became an NHL vegan hockey player? What did what did the your fans and the your fellow players yeah. say to that? Actually, the fans didn't say much, but the fellow players were laughing at me because they thought it was something that was never going to last. So they're like. There's no way this is gonna laugh. There's the, it's impossible. How are you gonna do that? Like they're like, how is how are you even gonna do that? If it, it you're, still, you, you're a tough guy. You know we don't want you to be all weak. So that's why when I did the testing before and after, when I came back and I did it after, it was one week before training camp. So I told all the guys actually I did the testing and guys I'm stronger than I was before. So when the guys saw that, it was like, oh my god, this is unbelievable. This is this is crazy. So what happened to my guys is. Nobody on the team became 100% vegan. But what they did is before the game, other than uh, eating meat, they would eat meat after because they started noticing that when they were eating meat before the game, they were more tired, using more energy. Yeah. Because often athletes, what we do before games, we eat we eat meal at noon. And then what happens when you eat meat at noon? Then you go to bed. You go to have a nap. 
And, and it's crazy because you're tired, but you have a nap to digest the meat that you just had. So what guys did now is that they didn't do that. They just uh, decided to, uh, you know, eat meat after the game instead. instead. So before the game, they had way more energy because the body was actually not digesting anything. What about, you, you said your fans, they didn't say much, but you're a very respected and famous man in Canada. Uh, what kind of effect do you think you've had on Canadians? And please, don't be modest. Tell us, yeah. because it's inspiring to hear about people who change other people's lives. Well, actually, in Montreal, there's a big trend that started happening because I began vegan in 2009, over 10 years now. And what happened is that once I did, because I was playing hockey, hockey is the national sport in Canada, it's so popular, more and more people started talking about it. And in Montreal, what happened is the vegan industry started to grow. They started to have more vegan restaurants. People were talking about it. And other athletes that were in Montreal were talking about it. They're like, oh, my God, this is something that is big. This is something that works. He did that because my testing I did before and after was online. and People were able to see this. So when they saw the result, other athletes started to try it. More people started talking about it. More media started talking about it. And then more athletes started talking about it too because they weren't embarrassed to admit that they were vegan because often they don't want to talk. They don't want to address it because they're like, they're going to be judged. But now this time, because I talked about it, more people were doing it. And then we find out some guys that we didn't know that were vegan before, some guys like they were like, um, you know, like, this is unreal. This is remarkable. So that's why, like, when people saw that, they were like, you know what? We could adapt this lifestyle also. Mm -hmm. On your, you have a radio show, a daily, daily radio show, right? Yeah. Uh, and, yes, and I do uh, every day of the week, uh, 10 to 12. Yeah, that's hard work because we can just barely get once <laughs> once a week out. But <laughs> that's impressive. Do you talk to, I'm sure you, you know, talk to many athletes. Do you talk to them about, about their diet? And talk to them about about veganism and 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 have that conversation on your show. I do all the time. Every yeah. day uh, I talk about veganism. I talk uh, to different people about it all the time. I never stop. Pretty much every day, even though it's a sports show that I have. There's always people ask me questions about it. Right. You know, Game Changer just came out, so now it's the topic of discussion of the month. Everybody every day talks about it. Mm. They're like, "Oh my God, see all those athletes!" Because it's crazy. Because uh, every time a documentary comes out, it brings the discussion again, and then people are like. Man, if it's good for athletes, imagine me in everyday life. I'm not an athlete, but it, how good this could be for me. It breaks down so many stereotypes every time you see a documentary like this. But what I like about Game Changer is the fact that often you do, uh, uh, you know, documentary that have too many images that are hard to watch. And people, after five minutes, they stop watching it because they say it's too horrible, it's too horrific, and too much suffering, and they don't like watching it. But when they look at a documentary like like Game Changer, where you see you see stats, you see studies, you see athletes talking about it by their own experience, then it's different. People identify to that, mm -hmm. and when they see this, it becomes something that for them that is much easier to relate to and to be like, you know what, this actually could be good because I see it. What the test that they do, and if I want to be healthier, there's something that I have to do. So uh, then that's why people have no problem watching to the end. And after not, and so many people have wrote me after they saw it and say, you know what, I'm gonna be vegan now. Yeah. Did you not? Know, did you know Dotsie's in is the cy female cyclist in Game Changers? She's the Olympic cyclist in no Game Changers. No way. Changer. Yes. <laughs> Yay, Dotsie! Whoa, that, that is that is amazing. You, you guys are, are in a film together. Yay, yeah, we're in a film together. <laughs> you're my God, you're my hero. That is awesome. <laughs> okay. You're, you're awesome. That's, that is awesome. That's an honor to talk to you. That's awesome. Thanks for having me. But you're a yeah. legend. You're a legend. That's hilarious. She is. She I is. was just going to say, you know, like, there's so many people that I know what you mean. Like, they can't watch the hard stuff because I just have to give just enormous props to mm -hmm. you because most people, I think, are – well, maybe just inherently, you know, self-centered. And so it, to go vegan is, is, is not an option if it's going to help other species, because I think most people are speciest anyway, and so those are lower beings. Um, they have to, to have proof that it is going to make them stronger and they're going to be able to do whatever they want to do, um, it, whether it's athletics or just in life. And so uh, I just, I, I mean, I was a fan before, and but just hearing you really give... Um, that testimony of why and how quickly, almost overnight or overnight, you said, that's not okay. I'm not going to pay into that. I'm not going to be a part of that system. And I may lose my career, even though you were in your last year. It doesn't matter because I'm going to stand up for the voiceless and just like, whoop. 
Yes. Huge. And huge. Do you, do you think that came from you, the fact that you are a minority in a predominantly mm-hmm. white country, so you have an idea of what oppression is, and because you were bullied as a child, that you have that sort of open heart for the yeah. voiceless and the oppressed? Uh, exactly right. You, pretty, you guys are good. You're good. And that's exactly the reason. You know, since I was a child, I went through so many negative stuff that after that, every injustice to me uh, was affecting me. People that had injustice towards uh, people that were homosexual, I have a problem with that. Towards people, religion, I have a problem with that. Color, anything, belief. So to me, respect towards animals is the same thing. It's the same fight. Since we're all equal, you know, fight for race or animal, to me, it's the same thing. There's an equality in everything. Mm-hmm. And that's why uh, ever since I, I, I battle my way to make it to the NHL, all the social fight about injustice, I took part of. Like, I wanted to jump on on anything to, to, to help others that needed the help, especially since I was a public person that had a voice. And since animals don't have a voice, if there wasn't people like me or you, uh, that my celebrity that's talking to, I'm, I'm so happy, uh, that we're talking about the subject, how the animal, who's going to take a stand for them? Would you imagine how the law would be if, if, if there wasn't people like us talking about it? And uh, and it keeps getting better and better every year because of it. So that's why, to me, it was something that was very important. And that's why I talked about it more and more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we do, and we do more and more documentaries. And that way, things are going to improve. And I just mm-hmm. love that you're, you were known as an enforcer. And we've had uh, many of these folks on these strong men who are tough they bodybuilding and etc yeah or Boxing, mma yeah. or fighting like sort of violent sports and yet they are vegan because their hearts are open and it's such a, it's a dichotomy george that you are the you're an enforcer but you have this empathy but when you think of it yes but since i was an enforcer what it helps me is that the fight for animals is way but way bigger than what i have to do on the ice to fight yeah when I was fighting on the ice, I was fighting guys that were millionaires that were making money for a living to fight. Now that paved the way for me to fight for animals. It, it's way bigger because we're a minority. So when it, yeah, I'm an enforcer, and the way I look at it, I'm an enforcer for animals. I did so many protests on the street against uh, you know slaughterhouse, against uh, you know fur coat and just for you. It's so ugly people that wear fur coats, but it's so important to talk about the, the cruelty that it takes. You know to create that coat and so many other things about leather and stuff like this. And that's a fight. That is a fight that is big, that every day that we do uh, be, to, to educate people because a lot of people don't actually know uh, the, the suffering that they're causing wearing and buying that stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's why right now, uh, even you uh, talking with me, you're an enforcer with me in the fight for animals. So you're a tough woman, just as just like I'm a tough guy. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, at Switch for Good, we try really hard to bring uh, shine a light on the fact that the dairy industry is in bed with racism since the vast majority of communities of color are completely lactose intolerant. So in America, yes. anyway, I know Canada is smarter and you guys have completely removed dairy as a food group from the dietary yes. guidelines for Canadians. We're still behind the eight ball and it's still um, a food group. We're trying to work to change that. And um, we've done a um, we went and spoke in Washington, D.C. and uh, to the USDA and their public plug, public commentary um, forum uh, because they're going to review the guidelines now to make changes again in 2020. So we'll see what happens. But what, what is your what is your take on this and, and in terms of dairy specifically and dietary racism? Well, you know, it, by the way, dairy was uh, in a public Canadian guide because of the economy, what, how much money that it was bringing to the economy. And that's the only reason why it was there. Yeah. But they were giving so much lactose still for people that were tolerant to it so they could have it. That after a while, people were getting so sick of it that they were like, are we going to stop defending the indefendable? Uh, they had no choice to take it out because there was going to be a lawsuit because, you know, they said that it was so good, but people were getting sick from it. So then now, and not just that, it's, you started to see more and more substitute of milk than their, than actual milk itself. If you go to a grocery store in Montreal now, there's more substitute of it than real milk. So how does it make sense that there's a food guide for something that, is trending and it's actually the meat industry is dying even more than the meat industry in Montreal in Canada. So when we saw that, the trend started to change. We knew that it was just a matter of time before the food guy would change. And again, if you look at the way that it was made and and, and, and how you know cows are suffering to do that, how they're 
the 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 uh, artificially inseminated so they could produce milk continuously and and all the stuff they're injecting them is in the milk and people are drinking that it just doesn't make sense uh, you know and all the lies that we sell good it is for you so that's why they have to do something about it and and, and the simple thing of drinking milk is actually uh, when people know actually how it's made you know we talk about compassion it doesn't show compassion if you know how you know what it takes to make this glass of milk mm-hmm. and uh, we talk about equality and anything you know if you believe in equality uh, and that you know we're all the same all living beings in this planet deserve to live then uh, you know it shouldn't be an issue about uh, about deciding to take a stand and and not having any animal product and any dairy product mm-hmm. You are also, as be, you are so compassionate to animals, but you're also a, a very strong environmentalist. Mm-hmm. You're a member of the Green Party, and I am too, here in the United States. Yeah. So could, could tell us about what kind of activism you do you, um, in terms of the environment, promoting materials made from recycled products, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, because when I became vegan... The Green Party, uh, I started doing so many conferences that the Green Party asked me if I, first of all, I found the Green Party, and I told them that's the only party that I vote for because of the environment, and this is I became vegan. So they would ask me if I would do a conference about the environment because I, it was drawing a lot of people, and I did. That's how it started. That's how I started to talk about the environment because, you know, th- I thought I heard you earlier when you're talking about the forest and all the stuff that we're doing to eat animals, but... You know, there's a simple ratio uh, just to tell people that are listening to us. It takes 14 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat. Mm -hmm. 14 pounds of grain. So when you look at that, every animal in the planet that we're feeding with those grain, if we fed people and said we would solve world starvation, just that. So it doesn't make sense. Every time you eat meat, you deprive somebody that is starving of food because of your love, meat. It's insane. And all the water and all the forest and everything that we're doing. So we know that all the cow ex- excrement altogether, if you combine it together, what it does to the environment is worse than the emission of all the cars and the planes that are there. And when you know this, why people are eating like cows? Why they're eating uh, burgers? Why they're keeping encouraging what is destroying environment like this? And, you know, it's with stats like this when you find out about the environment that you're like, you know what? We all talk about global warming. We're supporting Greta. But what are we doing in our everyday life? Because Greta is vegan. And it's crazy because we see millions and millions of people joining her walk for global warming. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, they're not even vegan. They're not even doing anything themselves. They only join it, uh, joining uh, a movement because there's a lot of people. But if you look at the consuming, uh, the way they consume every single day, they're not actually helping. But the thing is, what I've noticed when I'm talking to people is that when you talk about the environment, you talk about global warming, what happened is that because people don't feel that it affects them immediately, doesn't touch them, there's not as much of an impact. So mostly when I talk about veganism, I talk about health because a lot of people don't care about the environment because they say, oh, well, I have 20 years to live. It's not going to affect me. Uh, you know, it's not going to affect me uh, right. uh, before I die. So I don't care. And that's what's sad about it. But that's why when we talk about it, those are the things that uh, that is so important to address. Mm-hmm. So you speak a lot to different people. Do people come up to you and say, you know, I want to be vegan, but I don't know how to start? And if so, what do you say to them? What's well, your- you know, it, a lot of people ask me, that, obviously, that question every day about uh, how do I do it? How do I become vegan? Because they're afraid of it. They don't know what to do. And, you know... It does take a long, a long time to actually talk to someone about the step to take because everyone is different. Mm-hmm. If I have time to sit with them, talk for an hour, you know, I, I, it depends. I have to ask about uh, what they like to eat, their habits and stuff, and it takes a while to, because it's not just something that happens overnight. But uh, often what I do is I encourage people to do like I did, to go see a, um, you know, a vegan nutritionist because um, – there's so many things that you have to make sure that you, you consume in your diet to make sure you're not, uh, you're not low on any nutrients that uh, I wouldn't want to tell someone something and they're missing, let's say, B12, for example, or, or any other things. You know, if some women are lack, lacking like uh, iron and they're not eating the right way and the right 
the right food. So that's why it's so important, uh, I think, to talk to a specialist to be vegan because be vegan could be really technical also. Well, what's interesting is that a lot of people, certainly here in America, don't eat well and have a lot of effects from that. But as soon as they go vegan and they have effects, they blame it totally on the veganism. And when they eat, you know, meat McDonald's. and dairy, they just they like, don't they don't attribute it. Make so the connection. I just right. want to emphasize for our listeners: everybody has to eat a whole food diet. And so, if you eat a junk food vegan diet, that's going to affect you just like if you eat a dairy filled, yeah, right, junk food yeah, yeah, diet, yeah, yeah, right? No doubt. Um, I have a question about, um, I know you're involved in a lot of charities because as we've already made clear, you're a very good man. Um, yeah. you, do a, you do a lot Thank of good you. for the world. Uh, and one of them is uh, World Vision and helping to yeah. rebuild Haiti, right? Um, and I just, I, I just want your thoughts on this because I, I had um, a conflict in my heart with it. I had um, two, sponsored two kids from World Vision for years. Well, I'm making it sound right, like seven years. Um, and and um, then about four Christmases ago, I um, got communication from them. And they wanted me to buy a goat and three chickens for the family of one of these boys, which, you know, was for food. They were you know, going to kill them. And so I called and I said, I, I, I will buy them any food but animals. Like I just I just yeah. I, I don't believe in trading one life for another. Uh, and they shut me right down. So it, it, with that conflict in my heart, I just, I couldn't continue. And what, what, how do you deal with that internally, um, on a case by case basis or just in general? Actually, when I was with World Vision, it was, I was helping to rebuild the Grace Children Hospital after the earthquake. Okay. So, uh, you know, I raised a lot of money in, in Canada and then that way I was able to help out, you know, a hospital to, to get rebuilt. But, um, I totally understand what you're talking about because I uh, couldn't uh, sponsor uh, anyone in the world with with animal. Um, you know, like mm -hmm. I'd be okay to donate money and getting food, but uh, obviously slaughtering of animals of all kinds, whether it's for us or people that are poor. Uh, even though I know that people that are poor would not be wasting it and use the entire animal, but to me, uh, life of animals matter, whether it's for rich people or poor people. Uh, there's always better alternative, but I know that for some people there isn't a necessity, so I'm not judging. Right. It's not a crime to eat meat, so I'm not be judging them, but I'm not going to be endorsing any type of movement coming from me to get people to yeah. actually eat meat. Yeah, that's how I felt, but I felt like I was also um, kind of abandoning those two children. It was really... Yeah, that's a hard thing. But you, but you're looking at it. Turns. The system needs to change. You weren't yeah. blaming the children, but you're asking that the system change. And that, I had that same thing because mm -hmm. someone gave me um, uh, something from Heifer International, which they also they donate animals, calves to families so they can milk them. And this is when I was a vegetarian, so I thought it was fine. Mm -hmm. But now yeah. I wouldn't be able to do that. And but sometimes you have to sometimes sometimes you have to compromise and sometimes you don't yeah. and you didn't it's just yeah. hard yeah. but you know yeah. you're doing it better in the long the run in. yeah 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 so yeah. i want to just end with you talking a little bit about your book so that people know that they can get this really inspiring story yeah. in your own words it's called well, George LaRock, The Story of NHL's Unlikeliest Tough Guy. And from this interview, we can see you are a very unlikely tough guy. <laughs> well, thank you. And that's actually the point of it because, you know, people that see, look on YouTube and they see me fight, they get this idea of, oh, my God, a black guy that fights for a living. You must be mean. Oh, you must be, uh, you know, there's an image that comes with that. And uh, when you read my story and, and you get to know the real person behind it, and I think it's more important that people get to know the real person than what I did for a living because it's like another man. That person that fought people for a living is not me. It's something else. The real person that I am that I want to remember is the person that I am today. Mm -hmm. The vegan person that try to help out, that try to help animals and help people in the need and be, get involved in many charities to make a difference in the world and the society. This fight to me is much more important than what I was doing on the ice to entertain people that are drinking beer, eating chips or hot dogs while they're watching a hockey game, yelling to me, yelling at me to kill someone. You know, that's entertainment, but it's not real life. 
And that's why my book, at least, gives me a chance to tell my story so that people can know the real human being behind the, the hockey player that I was. Fantastic. I'm getting ready to go on vacation, and I keep saying to my husband, Kirk, I just, I just want like a really great autobiography book that's inspiring and motivating and now i've got it <laughs> thank, thank you george you. i'm downloading you, you, it tonight and it's going to bali <laughs> you're making me blush but uh, it does, the blushing color won't work on me. <laughs> george i just wanted to say thank you so much for being on our show you are an amazing human being and we are honored to speak with you thank you hey thank you very much for having me guys and hopefully next time in la i could see you guys <gasps> that would yes. be so cool Yes. Vegan, vegan dinner on me. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review. And zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future. <laughs>